Um, now you're working on um, something on your free time. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, about two years ago, I started a, um, a ministry called uh, the Daniel Collaborative, and it's, it's named after the prophet Daniel. And its, it's aim is to, I, I want to play a part in helping solve that formation problem that I talked about in churches. I know that, you know, I'm just, I'm just one small part in a, in a larger effort, larger church effort, but I want to do my part. So the whole aim of the ministry, just in short, is to, is to make Daniels. Uh, if you look at the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament, he's kind of a, he's, he's a timely model, a concrete exemplar for our youth. You know, he's, he faced a lot of opposition, uh, so much more than any of us could ever fathom facing in the West. And at every point in time, he knew what he was standing on. He knew what he was standing against. And he just didn't budge an inch. He was a courageous young man at every point in time when he was opposed. And so I, I just want to do my part in passing that baton on to the next generation and helping to form young men and women that look like Daniel. Hmm. So uh, I got a website, danielcollaborative.com. Um, I work with parents. Uh, church leaders and youth. Uh, for parents and church leaders, primarily what I want to do is uh, kind of help in the discipleship aspect. I want to help parents um, figure out how to disciple their kids amidst a busy suburban life. And um, youth leaders, I kind of want to come alongside them and help do the same, primarily just by telling stories of conversations that I get in the classroom. So as, as, as a philosophy teacher, I get into a lot of conversations about deep fundamental issues with kids every week, almost every day. I've got some sort of story about some sort of conversation. And so I'm going to tell people, you know, tell parents and tell youth leaders like, hey, this is what's going on in the classroom, in the schools. These are the patterns that I'm noticing. These patterns fit the data that we're seeing about Gen Z. And so now let's figure out what can we do about it? How should we respond to these patterns in the way that Gen Z is living and thinking and, and being? Mm -hmm. So um, that's primarily what I do with parents and uh, youth leaders is kind of help that discipleship angle. And then when I work directly with students, you know, I can teach on a lot of uh, apologetical uh, topics that, you know, a lot of others do, but one thing that I do that I think is at least somewhat unique is I, I'll come in and I'll, I'll role play in a conversation. So I'll act as the atheist and I'll role play in a conversation as an atheist where the, you know, the audience is trying to convince me and I'm talking back to them. And we'll go back and forth for 45 minutes to an hour. Then I'll come out of character and we'll debrief. We'll kind of go back over the conversation and ask, okay, how'd you do? Uh, what were some things that you had difficulty handling what were some things that I said that you didn't know how to answer? Let's walk back through all that. And then let's draw some lessons for here's, here's why you should devote time and energy to forming your intellect and forming your mind in a Christian way. Um, so the role play is kind of motivation to help students wake up to their need for apologetics and philosophy because they're going to get to college and they're going to, they're going to need it. So you can, you can tell them all day long. You can give them the verses. You can read them, uh, mm -hmm. the J.P. Moreland quotes from "Love Your God with All Your Mind," and it's like it's like you know pings off their head and bounces off their head. And they're like, yeah, 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 whatever, and they just dismiss it. But then when you actually get into a conversation where they see their need and they feel the tension and they feel the intensity, like, oh crap, I really don't know how to respond. Then that now you've shown them their need, and they they're in touch with it much better and they're much better motivated to actually go from there and devote part of their day to preparing themselves and preparing their intellects for what's to come. So that's primarily what I do in my spare time. That's really good. I like it, you're, you're getting them to experience mm -hmm. that, that need in a safe space. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah. 
Um, it's it's not an idea that I cooked up. I got it from actually some some other Biola guys um, that came to the program. But yeah, it's it's a really interactive and engaging teaching. You know, so you yeah. can you can sit there and give them a 25, 30 minute sermon, or you can engage them in some sort of back and forth, like a scrimmage, you know, and you said it perfectly safe environment. These are conversations they are going to have when they get out on their own. They cannot avoid them. Yeah. So it's either you have them now and you get to shepherd them through it or you wait and then they have it when they're out on their own and they don't know what to do with it. Deal with fallout. So, yeah. 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 So say in a safe environment is, is right. You know? So yeah, that and trying to talk with parents and letting them know like, this is what's going on in classrooms. These are what, this is, this is the patterns that I'm seeing in students. Now let's figure out what to do about it. Pretty fun. That sounds great. How long has the da Daniel collaborative been in existence? About a year and a half, two years. Okay. And yeah. It sounds to me, it sounds like a wrestling match or it sounds like a wrestling um, practice where you wrestle and then you debrief and go, what happened there? Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> how do you prevent that. the guy from doing that? <laughs> yeah. Um, that, that's a really good way to put it. In my coaching experience, the kids that progressed the most and became the most skilled at their sport were the ones that were competing all the time. And they were the one, like the one thing that we would do that would give them exposure and give them matches is we would have scrimmages often. So on a Saturday for two hours, instead of going to like a 12 hour tournament in the off season, like in the summer, say we would have a bunch of teams over to our room and we would just run matches. And so you would, in a two hour time span, you would get 10 to 12 matches with guys that weren't on your team. And uh, it would be really, really physically tiring. But if you do that a bunch of times, you're going to get really good. Yeah. Because those, those scrimmage matches, like one scrimmage match is like five practices, you know? So you can talk about this all day long in your youth group, but are you actually getting into the scrimmages and getting into the conversations where you have to, you know, kind of in a, in a really intense fashion, think and, and and figure out where your where your weaknesses are and and work on those yeah yeah and it's personal too because you if you keep getting pinned or you keep getting